you very much for for that, guys. All right. So I'd like to talk a little bit about fetish psychology, why they exist. Why do fetishes exist? And um, as it turns out, we don't really know. There are a lot of different theories out there. We don't know exactly why fetishes exist. Um, no single cause has ever been established. Now, um, it seems that most fetishes, they present themselves by the time of puberty. They tend to, uh, they, they, might res- they, they might come about earlier. Fetishes tend not to take place later on in life. It's normally that if during the time of puberty you develop a fetish, it'll, it might stick with you for the rest of your life, um, but you probably won't develop a fetish afterwards um, in, unless it's by some kind of um, just being exposed to it later on in life. Okay. Now, um, as was mentioned earlier, fetishes are predominantly male, and again, we're going to talk about why that might be uh, a little further forward. Yes, please. I'm not sure how true this is, but I knew someone with a foot fetish, and how the way that he explained it was that it was uh, something to do with how the, f- the part of the brain that processes it f- processes. <laughs> 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 Okay, it's okay, it's okay. All right, so first, first I'll say, <laughs> no, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. Sorry, I'm sorry for, I'm sorry for shushing on you. Um, okay, so um, as it turns out, human beings are not the only, uh, are not the only ones to have fetishes, but we actually see fetishes exist in other primates as well, um, as well as in rats, which we'll get to in a little bit. So first of all, starting with the common chimpanzee. So there were some chimpanzees that were given a boot, um, and uh, there were some chimpanzees that without any kind of instruction, they began kind of obsessively staring at this boot. They would touch the boot. There was one chimpanzee in particular in this one zoo where this experiment was done. This is one experiment, so nothing is... uh, uh, r- this isn't like a, a real scientific um, uh, survey, definitive, but um, this one chimpanzee became erect whenever he was presented with this boot. Um, he began to rub his penis against the boot, he began to masturbate, and then he began to consume his ejaculate. We know, we know of one chimpanzee. We know of one chimpanzee <laughs> that has done this. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Okay, now there's also a guinea baboon who at the sight of a boot would become erect and he would rub on the boot. He would smell the boot, but this guinea baboon, he didn't masturbate. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So, uh, so why the hell do these things exist? Well, um, there's one reason here, which is it's called classical conditioning. Everybody familiar with Pavlov's dog? Yeah. Okay. So Pavlov's dog. Um, Pavlov would ring a bell uh, before feeding his dogs, and when uh, after doing this so many times, after a while, he didn't need to present them with food anymore. He would just ring the bell, and the dogs would begin to salivate. So um, whenever there is a biological association with some non-biological stimulus. It's called some kind of uh, Pavlovian response or classical conditioning. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, so we see the same thing with sex objects. So we've taken boots, we've taken geometric shapes, and we've taken penny jars. Um, This is with uh, many different animals. We've actually done this, including humans. And we find uh, that if we first pair them with some kind of sexual activity, there's a penny jar next to them while having sex, and then after a while we don't include the sex, we just place a penny jar, they become erect, um, and uh, in some cases, they're only able to reach orgasm if that sexual, if that non-sexual object is placed beside them, right? So we're saying maybe this is why fetishes exist amongst us, um, is because um, is because we're just used to having these objects around. Now, uh, John Bancroft, uh, he was the director of the Kinsey Institute from, I think, 1995 until, uh, I think I have it, until 2004. Um, he was the director of the Kinsey Institute. He said this certainly doesn't actually explain all fetishes. It's probably a combination of um, classical conditioning mixed with something else. So what is that something else? Well, it might be... Oh, first, sorry, let me talk about rats. This is cool. Let me talk about rats. Okay. Um, uh, Okay, so... 
Uh, rats, we found, are able to develop sexual preferences for neutrally or noxiously scented partners if paired with early sexual experiences. So noxious just means like really unpleasant. So even if the, the, the other rat, the partner rat, doesn't smell very good, the rat will still be attracted to this rat if that scent is paired in their early sexual experiences. They develop sexual preference to morphine or oxytocin if it's paired with early sexual experiences as well. So we went into the back of the rat brain and we injected in morphine and we injected in oxytocin when they were climaxing. Afterwards, if we just gave them oxytocin or just gave them morphine, then they would, um, they would become sexually aroused even without some kind of external sexual stimuli. Um, so rats can be conditioned to show increased arousal in the presence of particular objects, and we experimented with this particularly, I don't know why they chose this, but with a plastic toy fish. Um, now, um, the strangest one, in my opinion. So there were uh, several rats that were forced to wear Velcro tethering jackets during their early sexual experiences, and these rats exhibited severe deficits in sexual performances when they were not wearing the jackets. Now, many of these rats were unable to reach climax if they weren't wearing these Velcro jackets. A Velcro jacket, not a traditional sexual object, therefore it's a fetish, and they're not able to climax without it. Right. Okay. So that's Pavlovian, Pavlovian response sexually in rats. Now, there's also something called imprinting. God damn it! I'm sorry that the text is so small here, guys. This I I would have liked to have done this differently. I hope that's okay. Okay. So general. I know. Thank you, Dean. So uh, general imprinting in psychology is when learning occurs at a particular age or a particular life stage that is rapid and apparently independent of the consequences of behavior. So if there was any stage in your life when you just started acting tremendously differently as a human being, um, not really dependent on whether you are benefiting from this change in your action, that is considered imprinting. It's something that happens in many, many animals, including human beings. Now, sexual imprinting is when young animals learn the characteristics of uh, a desirable mate at a very young age, very, very quickly. Like most of us, I imagine, didn't choose the kind of mates that we find desirable. We just find them desirable. We can't help it, and it probably happened very quickly, and maybe it hasn't changed very much. Does anybody know what this is? Bird. What kind of bird? Anybody know? <laughs> Thank you. Jesus. Yes, this is a male zebra finch. Okay, yeah, this is a male zebra finch. Okay, so um, as it turns out, if a male zebra finch is raised, thank you, Adine, our in-house bird expert, um, if a male zebra finch is raised by uh, a um, caretaker that is not his mother, that looks different than his mother, that zebra finch will prefer a sexual partner that looks like its childhood caretaker. If the zebra finch is taken care of by his mother, then it's very likely that that finch will choose a sexual partner that in, in a way resembles its mother. So if from an early age, you learn uh, who to be sexually attracted to based on who's taking care of you when you're young. Okay, um, uh, I'm actually just going to move on for the sake of time. Okay, now, uh, what, did she leave? Did Lucy, Lucy went to the bathroom. Good, she already knew this. Okay, so um, does anybody know uh, Ramachandran, the modern philosopher and neuroscientist? He's awesome, check him out. But uh, Ramachandran, he put together this, uh, this theory of neurological cross-wiring. So he, he recognized that the region of the brain processing sensory input from the feet lies immediately next to the region that's processing genital stimulation. So there's a very good chance that there's just some kind of cross-wiring taking place. And that an accidental link between these regions could explain the prevalence of foot fetishism. Okay. Now, in one in unusual case, the anterior Tempor that just means the front. The front portion of the lobe, um, it relieved. Uh, it was relieved in an uh, epileptic man's. It relieved an epileptic man's fetish for safety pins. So he had this portion of his brain removed, and then he no longer had a fetish for safety pins. <laughs> mm. What is a fetish for safety pins? Good, good. No, oh, no. Yes. Sorry, again? What else did he lose? Just the safety pin fetish? Well, I, 
I guess I guess I don't know. Oh, oh. So he he was suffering from from epilepsy. So he had this he had this. Uh, he had this surgery because he was an epileptic. So they removed the part of his brain that was causing the epilepsy. And then after uh, removing the part of his brain that was causing the epilepsy, he also lost his safety pin fetish. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he was still sexually active after this. It only removed his uh, his fetish for safety pins. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is all from the WHO, the World the World Health Organization. This is the last slide that I'm going to show, and then we're going to go into a, a small group discussion, and and, and we're going to see a little demonstration here. Um, so, um, not all fetishes are disorders. The same fetish in one person can be a disorder and not a disorder in another person. If you've done a lot of psychological study, you know that the way that things are considered to be disorders have to do with the effects that they're having on your life. So if a person is unable to reach sexual climax without the existence of this fetish, then it's considered a disorder. And if it's taking over such a part of their life that they're in constant shame and anxiety over the existence of this fetish, then it's considered a disorder. In these two cases, it's very common for someone to try to find help. Also, the WHO says that a sexual fetish must persist for at least six months in order for it to be considered uh, a disorder and be unwanted and be unable to reach climax without it. There's a group called, uh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, there are treatments that are out there. Again, um, there are only disorders under those particular circumstances. Um, generally, the goal of treatment has to do with eliminating criminal activity if your fetish is uh, causing you to commit some kind of criminal activity. Also, to reduce the reliance on the fetish to reach sexual satisfaction. Um, and then also just to improve your general relationship skills because sometimes certain fetishes do get in the way. There are drugs that help with this. SS our eyes, um, they generally reduce sexual drive it, totally. Uh, sorry, they don't reduce it totally, but they reduce it generally. So you'll just have a much lower libido from taking SSRIs, so they're often prescribed for people with some kind of sexual fetish. Um, also, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is often used to treat fetishes, and some relationship counselors are used to treat fetishes. All right, guys. So we're going to move into um, our last small group discussion here. After this small group discussion, we're going to have, and actually during... Um, we're going to have a demonstration of uh, some Japanese rope bondage. Could I, could I just get Chio and Selena to stand up for us, please? Can I please get a big round of applause for Selena and Chio? Thank you so much, guys. You want to turn around for us, please? Thank you. Yeah, all right. Their demonstration here is going to last, um, we planned it for about 45 minutes, so I think we're going to be going in, until about 10.20 tonight. I hope that's all right with everybody. Um, until around 10.20. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to have this conversation. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of history uh, in a little while on uh, Japanese rope bondage, and then we're just going to watch them for a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to call it, then we're going to call it a night. Um, Rich is also here. Did, I think Rich went to the bathroom, but we, we have a musician that's also going to be helping us out uh, here tonight. So, so, um, thank you so much, guys. Um, so, for 10 minutes, let's talk about this one. Um, should fetishes be taught in teenage sex ed classes? Why or why not? Thanks, guys. And we'll come back in about 10 minutes.